Well, sin is a devourer. Sin is a devourer. Just as a locust horde comes upon a land and strips it bare, makes it barren, robs it of its fruitfulness, and leaves it desolate, sin devours souls. Not just lands are in view here. Souls are in view here. It is something that devours. It is like rust that devours precious metal. It is like moth that devours fine clothing. Sin devours. It is like leprosy. And it eats and it eats away. And it chews and it chews away. And if you've ever felt the sting of your sin, even as a Christian, you know this is true. It can strip a soul bare. And the worst part of it is really it robs our fruitfulness to the Lord. Our souls, our lives are meant to be fruitful unto God. And when we indulge in sin, we become like a land stripped of its harvest. Indulgence in sin ravages our years. Tremendous loss comes from times and seasons spent in sin. And the thing, brethren, is when the Holy Spirit starts to convict us of it, what happens when the Holy Spirit awakens our soul? Regret comes, doesn't it? Regret comes, grief comes. We mourn and we say, what have I done? What has my sin and my indulgence done to me? I am like that prodigal who has wasted away all of my father's inheritance. I've been in this faraway country of sin and I've been reduced to nothing. All the days of my sojourning, I seem to say, are filled with evil. And we're horrified as we see what an utter, utter waste my days have been. Times meant to be redeemed for the glory of Christ have instead been set, spent in service of that which Christ hates. And even as a believer, sometimes as a repentant believer, repentant of these things, we mourn and our grip on hope is released. Grief over time that was spent wasted in sin makes us unfruitful today. And we don't make forward progress with God because we do see what we have done and how we have been utterly useless to the Lord and how our sin has defiled us in times past as well as caused us to, to eat away at what we've perceived the kingdom ought to be. In that way, past barrenness can be a hindrance to present fruitfulness as we live with regret. This is a great problem for many who are spiritually sensitive. And maybe you're one of those, and you feel the tremendous loss. But God would have us look to texts like Joel 2.25. I will restore to you that the years the locust hath eaten. We can have hope in the Lord, as with Job, that our latter years may be more greatly blessed than our former years. He can restore fruitfulness that sin has taken away. Far more, in fact. What he did with Abram, Moses, Sarah, Manasseh, the Apostle Paul, he can do with me and with you. For as terrible as sin is to strip me of my years, Christ Jesus is far greater to restore. You know, it does not matter if I am 80 years and have just been converted. I've just repented. In a week of my life, the God who made all things out of nothing in the space of six days can do something with me. Can he not? Because it's not me at the end of the day that is fruitful. It is God who works in me. And so we look to the Lord. That is what faith and hope looks to. Sometimes, in fact, our unfruitfulness and what sin has done in our life is in fact a barrier to repentance itself. And I'll speak to that a little bit later. But we find the goodness of the Lord. And what does the Lord say? The goodness of the Lord is meant to lead us to repentance. Here the Lord in this text is drawing you 
with his goodness. Is this chapter not a chapter of repentance after all? Calling you to rend your heart and not your garments. And how the Lord draws you to repentance with his overflowing and abundant grace. Put away your sin and put away your fears. He says, fear not in this text. And he says, I can restore to you the years that the locust have chewed away. In a, so many ways, the Lord is inducing us to come, to turn away from sin, and to put away every fear. Will the Lord re, uh, uh, receive me? He says, don't fear. Turn from your sin and turn to me. Fear not. Rend your heart and not your garments. Repent and come to me, and I will repent. I will come to you. He says, are you afraid of all your loss? He says, do not fear. I can restore what the locusts have chewed away. This is, in every way, the Lord removing our, uh, any impediments our flesh has put in way of repentance. And you are to take hold of it. So, with that, our theme tonight will be Christ restoring the years sin has stolen. Christ restoring the years sin has stolen. And I'll divide our sermon into two heads. The first is ruin and repentance, ruin and repentance, and the second is restoration and rejoicing. First, ruin and repentance. Some contextual remarks to ground us in the text. This is not a series on Joel, obviously. And so with limited time tonight, the application will be mostly personal, not historical, and not corporate, which is where uh, this is a corporate text. In a lot of ways, this has application to the church corporately, but I want to mention that to you in how I'm treating this text. With that said, let's begin with our prophet's name, which is Joel. That's a compound name. It is formed of Jehovah and El, God. Jehovah is God, is the name of the prophet. Fitting for a prophet of God who has to preach against idolatry. There is one God. He is Jehovah. Now, he prophesied before Judah was invaded by the Assyrians under Sennacherib. And let's consider the state of Judah at the time Joel prophesied. Well, back in chapter 1, locusts had devoured the land and brought a great famine. Chapter 1 and verse 4, it's just probably a page back for you in your Bible, memorably, memorably says, That which the palmer worm hath left uh, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the cankerworm eaten. And that which the cankerworm hath left, the caterpillar eaten. And that's what our verse in chapter 225 calls us back to. Now, there are many theories on what the palmer worm and the cankerworm are. Some believe it to be the life cycle of the locusts, or perhaps they're differing species. Now, we could get bogged down in that, but I don't think that that is where the Lord would have our attention to be drawn tonight. So let's put that aside for the moment. The point is this. The point is this. There was a total and utter devastation of Judah's crops. Waves of hordes of these insects had stripped the land totally bare and left it totally barren. A complete and total desolation that, in fact, the scripture says has never been seen before. And I want you to think of what this means for the labors of God's people. All of their labors, years of fruitfulness taken away from them. Maybe a lifetime of careful labor gone through these hordes of insects. Planting and plowing and reaping and sowing. All of it erased in this devastation that was faced by the people of God. In fact, in chapter 1, Joel asked the old men, has such a thing been seen before? The ancients of Judah had never seen anything like it in all their years. That's how great this, and um, how of the ordinary, quote-unquote, this was. This was not some natural cyclical locust swarm. This was a total decimation of Judah, never before seen. And Joel said, tell your grandchildren in chapter 1, verse 3, tell ye your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. The prophet warns, tell your children of what is happening here. 
Let them know so that they would turn away from your own folly, seeing the judgment of the Lord in these things. And even that devastation was just a precursor of more horrifying events. In the first part of chapter 2, the locust horde was foreshadowing an invasion of a great army. Likely the Assyrians here are prophesied of. And a terrible desolation that army brought. In Isaiah 8, 5 through 8, you can read that another time. You would read that Assyria would invade Judah even up to his neck. Almost as though he is drowning under the onslaught here. As though waters are submerging Judah. That's a different metaphor. But it illustrates the devouring nature of the army. Might even tell you a little bit of what drowning in sin is like. We can talk about that another time. Well, these are horrible things. But are they just a series of so-called unfortunate coincidences or events? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. God is sovereign over all of this. There are no coincidences, children. Learn that well. In Amos 3.6, Shall there be evil or calamity in a city? And the Lord hath not done it. These events were God's hands upon his people. But, okay, we know that. But why? Why? It's their unfaithfulness. Their own sin and idolatry. Their breach of the covenant that God had made with them. You know, the very things that had happened, God had promised, would happen to them for their unfaithfulness. As part of the curses given for disobedience, if you want, you can turn to Deuteronomy 28 and see these things for yourself in the word of God and see how these things are prophesied and are promised to be given to the people of God. Deuteronomy 28 verses 33 and 34. This is a section on the threatenings given by God to the people if they're unfaithful when they come in the land. He says, the fruit of thy land, in verse 33, Deuteronomy 28, the fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed alway, so that thou shalt be mad, or that means to go insane, for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. I'll stop there for a moment. All of your labors, he says, will be crushed and devoured to the point, right? And maybe you've sensed loss in your life, even of your material estate, or maybe of something more precious than that. And you can feel like you're going mad. You can feel like you're going insane. And this is what the Lord promised to the people if they be unfaithful to him and his covenant. Listen to what comes next, though, in verses, I'm going to drop down to verse 38. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field and shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. I hope that's starting to sound familiar. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes. Why? For the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All thy trees and fruit of thy land shall the locust consume. I'll leave that there for now. So this locust horde in Joel, what was it but God keeping his promise? God keeping his promise to the people of God to deal with their gross unfaithfulness. And you know, the thing is, when the locusts decimated the land, if they were spiritually sensitive, they wouldn't have even needed the prophet Joel to tell them what was going on. They would have simply opened the word of God or known it and said, oh, this is God's judgment. Why? Because we are unfaithful. You see, the thing is, brethren, they ought to have already remembered what the Lord had told them and connected the dots. And that is how we often neglect what the word of God plainly speaks to. And when we see God's judgments, when we see his chastisements, we do not connect the dots as we ought to. Now, the God, Lord is very gracious to us. He often sends us ministers to come 
to the pulpit and to preach as the prophets, we had a colloquium address on how ministers who preach are like small p prophets, in which they take the word of God and they apply it to you. And like the prophet Joel, they sometimes have to connect the dots. Look, thou art the man, thou art the woman. See what God has said in the word of God, and you now, must now understand what is happening. And so the core problem in this time is that the word of the Lord was scarce. There wasn't a famine. The first famine was not the famine of the locusts. It was a famine of the word. And that is the greater famine, and that is the greater problem. A famine of the word. And connected to these spiritual famines, what really ought to have gotten their attention in the midst of the uh, locust plague was to the spiritually sensitive, the most uh, horrifying plague of all, which follows after it, most horrifying famine of all, I should say. There's a famine of sacrifice. Back in Joel 1 verse 9, the meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. Now when the famine comes, think about this. Now there are no more animals to offer in the sacrifice to the Lord. Now, if you were spiritually sensitive at this time, what would that signify for you? A sacrifice for sin being cut off from the land? Can no longer give to the Lord what he has asked for, for my sin? The priests, the Lord's ministers, mourn. Now, this kind of thing can happen today, brethren. Though Christ, of course, is, as the Bible says, our once and for all sacrifice. But with the famine of the word comes what? A famine of presenting Christ and him crucified to the people of God. And this is the greater famine that we ought to mourn. If tomorrow, right, the Lord took away from all the store shelves your meat and your produce, and you start to mourn that, I think in a sense you are mourning too late. Because all throughout this land, there is a famine of the word. And there's a famine of the gospel. Christ and him crucified is scarce. There are many churches in the land. I don't know what Greenville, South Carolina is like. I will speak of Dallas, where I am right now. There is a tremendous famine of preaching of Christ and him crucified. Of the free offer of the gospel. Of men being told, here is Christ sacrificed for sinners. And you may take of him. Instead, what we find in our pulpits, brethren, we find comedy, we find platitudes, we find moralism. We have so many churches in the Dallas area, but you can scarcely find one that will preach Christ and the gospel. This is the greater famine that we ought to be spiritually sensitive to, brethren. I don't know if you've ever had a kind of panic You know, during COVID, there were all kinds of panics over shortness of things. Even silly things like toilet paper. And some of you were probably panicking over that. And yet, many of us are spiritually insensitive to the greater famine. And that ought not be. That is a tragedy and that is a calamity. And let us just ask, whose fault is it? It's the church's fault. Isn't it? This is the church's fault. It is the Lord chastening us, brethren, and we best hear him. So let us take note when the Lord, cha- when calamity comes, and let us be sensible if it is the Lord's chastening and it is God calling us to search our ways. You know, it's been quite astonishing to see temporal chastisements upon God's people go unheeded, whether individually or on congregations, or on denominations. How rare is it for even the ministers of God to ask, is it I? Is it us? Is this the reason, O Lord, thou art sore with the land? The unfaithfulness of us. But each of us have to take note of calamity that it may be the result of our sin. It not always is. 
It may even be the sin of another that has affected us, or the sin of a church, or the sin of a nation. Now you think about this, many were caught up in the famine of Joel's time that were faithful. Right? You think of Joel himself. You think in other cases, Jeremiah. Think of Daniel. Even the faithful get caught up in these things. And here's something to take note of. Right? Even as many of us have fled to refuge in denominations like this, believing it to be faithful and such, the sins of the church universal affect us regardless of denomination. Let us never forget that. The sins of the church are our sins. God looks upon us as his people. Joel is caught up in this. Jeremiah will be caught up in this. Daniel was caught up in this. We are caught up in this. As we are all part of God's people, let's not pat ourselves on the back. This is a time of mourning, a time of rending hearts. But let me get back to something. Sin is a devourer. Look upon all these things, these calamities. These are the result of sin and idolatry. And so children, young people, if you take anything out of this sermon, hear that. Sin is a devourer. It destroys, it consumes, it'll consume you. It's like a raging fire. It'll consume all in your life. Your own sin will affect others. It'll affect your congregation. It'll affect the people of God. Think of how God portrays sin in his world, in his word. Here in Joel, the effect is like a locust horde and a famine, like a vicious army that burns a nation to the ground, pillaging, murdering, and raping. Yes, that is what it does to the soul. Pillages, murders, and rapes. Can't be polite about sin. Brethren, it is disgusting, it is evil, it is vile, and it devours. It's not your friend. Sin is like leprosy in the Bible. And along with the slow, unclean death that results from leprosy is the effect of sin on a soul. But isn't it a terrible thing? that we are often more affected and horrified by leprosy and locusts than sin. That should never be. Sin is far, far worse. Sin is not to be toyed with, not to be played with. It is a devourer. It will bring a famine to you. If you can meditate every day of your life of sin as a locust toward upon your soul and as leprosy, making you unclean, you will do well in seeking the Lord's grace to mortify it. So in our text, when the chastisement comes from the plague and famine and armies, what was the Lord's prescription? I don't want to get past it. Verses 12 through 14, repentance. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye to, even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is, here's the reason, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave what? A blessing behind, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. We are so vile. And our sin is so terrible. And that's what makes the grace of the Lord so astonishing, isn't it? He says, rend your heart. As in Psalm 51, he says he will not despise the contrite heart broken over sin. He wants you to turn to him with all your heart in repentance. Sin, your sin is a departure from God. Repentance is a return to him, isn't it? So you need to leave your sin behind, he says. He says it devours your years. It is time gone. It is time wasted. It is a spiritual famine. But I am gracious and merciful to you. So come to me. Friend, is this a season where you are backslidden in your sin? Are you sensible to what it has done to you and what it is doing to you? 
devouring your soul like this, chewing and gnawing away at your soul bit by bit. And you find yourself unfruitful, you know it, just as the sacrifice for sin had ceased in Joel 1. The sacrifice of praise has stopped, hasn't it, in your life? I can tell you one thing about every backslider. The sacrifice of praise is gone or it is formal. It's just a checkbox on the list. The sacrifice of praise is gone, the fruit of your lips. How long has it been for some of you since you have walked constant with Christ? Constant with Christ. How long has there been lukewarmness? Weariness with God? Is the world more attractive to you than Christ presently? Is there a secret sin you are nurturing in your heart that you're keeping away from those who know you, from your elders and your pastor, but God sees? You know what this is, if we were to press the analogy here? It's like locust larva in your soul. And it's ready to burst. And it's ready to devour you and consume you. Is it not time for you to return to God? Even if it has been decades of sin and backsliding. Is it not time for you to return to God? I'll just say what? Yes. It is time. It is time. There ought to be no other answer that your soul should give but yes. It is time for me to return to the Lord. Do you not hear his grace? I will be gracious to you. I am gracious. I am merciful. That's how he induces you to come to him, isn't it? He says, I am gracious. I am merciful. So come to me. And I may even leave a blessing behind for you. What a God is this. Our sin is evil. It's a stench in his nostrils. It is wickedness. It is treason against God. He says, but I am gracious and merciful. The only barrier is yourself. Not him. He holds his arms wide open. Oh, you love your sin that much, don't you? To not come. But come. It is time to return to God in Christ. Well, maybe even as you think on this, you start to mourn. And mourning is good and proper in repentance, and you start to mourn that your life and your vitality has been robbed by sin, wasted away. And so many say, I have walked in sin for so long. What is the point in walking with God now? How much time has been lost, and my time is running out? Even if you are very young, some men, and we don't know how many days we have, of course, but even some very young people will say, well, my days are running out and I've spent so much time in sin. How can I walk with God now? This has been a great impediment to the reformation of God's people. It often stymies us. I've had to counsel men like this and women too. Some even say when they think of conversion and they think of coming to the Lord uh, in faith, they say, I am too old now to walk with the Lord. Seventy years or more I have spent in sin. What point is there in the fleeting moments that I have left to walk with Christ? Brethren, let me tell you this. The devil is a master manipulator. First, he will tempt you to indulge in sin for long seasons, won't he? And then when the Holy Spirit is grabbing a hold of you, right, what will he do? He will tempt you in the other direction. He says, well, what is the point of your repentance? You have loved sin for so long. You have walked in it for so long. What can you possibly do to make up for all of that? What is the point in returning to the Redeemer? How, what use could you, so unclean, so filthy, do in the service of God who is holy? The hopelessness begins, and you lose track of what God has called you to be and to do. But in verse 21, the Lord says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Fear not. There is often a fear in turning to the Lord, 
especially as his holiness is impressed. And he is holy. His holiness is impressed and we fear to turn. But isn't it incredible that the Holy One can say, fear not. In fact, this seems to be one of Christ's own favorite expressions, isn't it? Fear not. So we look to the mediator. We look to Jesus who says, fear not. He says, it is I, be not afraid. And he induces us to come to him. Repent to me, put your fears away. I will fully and totally receive you. He promises this kind of thing in our text even. But there will be a restoration of your relationship with God through Christ. Fear not. Repent of your sin to the Lord who says he will have compassion on you. But you ask, what of my wasted years, of my 70, 80 years maybe of walking away from God? Well, that brings us to verse 25, which we'll consider in our final head, restoration and rejoicing. So sin devours our years, and the few years that we have can seem wasted away. Now, I'm not often prone to speak of myself as I preach, but this is an area in which I have some personal experience. I was 30 years old when I was converted, um, and I've only been about 16 years into my conversion now. That means I'm 46 years old. I've been born again for that long. Two-thirds of my life has been spent apart from the Savior my precious Redeemer, such that in the ministry now, I've only been in it about three and a half years, and I'm middle-aged. While many of my colleagues of the same age are often 20 years plus in the ministry. And sometimes that can weigh heavy on me. How many years of service do I have for the Lord? Why could I not have known the Lord sooner? Why did I have to spend so much time in my sin, which I, I regret and I I mourn over and I grieve, though I know the Lord has taken it away and I have repented of it. Sometimes I am tempted to look back on those years, 30 years as an idolater, as an unbeliever, even at times a persecutor of the people of God in the context I was in. And it can weigh heavy on me. Now, before I talk about the release of that to the Lord, Boys and girls, I want to speak to you. Make the most of your time with the Lord in your early years. Make the most of your time with the Lord in your early years. Though the Lord is very gracious to me, there are still things that I will probably not possess in terms of my knowledge of the Lord this side of glory simply because of the numbers of years that I have spent in unbelief. But you can know the Lord from a very early age. You can read that, the Holy Scriptures many, many more times than I will get to read in the remainder of my life. And get to know the Lord on your knees in some very intimate ways that I lost out on. To have childlike faith as a child is so precious. And you are being raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and that is God's gift to you. Do not despise it. He will call you to account for it one day. At my age, you will likely have known Christ and I will get to know my whole life. That's a precious thought to me for you. But for those of us here, like me, who keenly feel the loss of our years, listen to God's gracious word in verse 25. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. I will restore to you the years. This is a word of grace, people of God. What sin has destroyed, what covenant unfaithfulness has removed, he says... I will give you abundantly more and restore. He says it is as if sin has not devoured, as if the destruction had not come. You know, the root word in Hebrew for restore is shalom, peace. What a thought that is. All right, even that restoration is seen as peace with God. What grace there is in Christ. 
Is this not an exceedingly great and precious promise from the Lord, brethren? Designed to have us seek the Lord and pursue him, to repent and to put away our regrets and to walk with the Lord seeking faithfulness. What does that mean, though? That he will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Will he add years to your life? Is he going to add an extra 30 years to my life? No. I don't think so. And in fact, that would not be something I would desire because it is better to depart and be with Christ. However, what the Lord says and is so evident to see through Scripture examples is that those who repent and turn to him, he can make exceeding fruitful. Very fruitful. Because it is God who works in you to accomplish his good pleasure. He is the source of the saints' fruitfulness, not they themselves. Can he not accomplish children? I'll speak to you again. You know this from the Bible. He can accomplish in a day what the unbeliever says requires billions of years. Men disbelieve, children, you know this, that God can create all of this in the space of six days. And if you're an unbeliever here, no, billions of years were not required, hardly. So what can the God who created all things out of nothing in the space of six days do with a nothing like me? He makes all things new, does he not? He can transform the years that are left into years of exceeding fruitfulness. If you would repent and seek such fruitfulness from the Lord. You know, you think of examples. What of Moses? 80 years old, two-thirds into his own life, gone before called to function as a redeemer. Did not the Lord more greatly bless the latter 40 years of that man over his first 80? Yes. What of Paul, the apostle? For about 30 years he lived apart, lived apart from Christ. What were his latter days? Right? First, his former days. A blasphemer, a persecutor, an injurious, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the church of God. Here is this man, locusts, had chewed away at his soul and his life. A terrible and wicked man that he was. He wouldn't pull any punches, and we ought not either. But then Christ knocks him down and lifts him up. And were his latter days not incredibly fruitful? How much of our New Testament comes through the Holy Spirit's work in his life? giving us the clearest expositions of the doctrines of grace and glory to come. His heart was turned to flame for Jesus, and what could Christ do with that? A debtor to mercy, right? How did he say he lived his life? The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He who was forgiven much, loved much. And what? He went to the ends of the earth at the time, planting churches in the time he had. Brethren, these are not natural things. This is the work of grace in his heart. The Lord's blessing his latter days more than his former days. He restored, did he not restore the years that the locusts had devoured? Here is how Paul lived in view of his past, and you may know it well in Philippians 3. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. What does he do? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. What does he say? Be thus minded. Be thus minded. And if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. God has revealed this unto you. Forget what is behind if you have repented. Reach forth to what is before. Reach forth to whom? Christ. The Apostle Paul was always stretching forth towards Christ. Always. Here is a man who once breathed slaughter against the church, against the bride. 
Why dost thou persecute me? Jesus said. And now he reaches forth to that very Jesus. And how his life is fruitful. So what do you do with your regret, brethren? Well, you need to bring your regret to God in repentance. If you are to have a broken heart over sin, and you confess it to God. But then you are to turn to him. You are to leave it with him. You express in prayer the regret of the wasted years. Then you arise from your knees, and you leave your regret behind with hope, and anticipation, reaching forth to what is before you. What is before you? A life now lived for the glory of God. That is what is before you, if you be in Christ. You say what is done is done, but Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a glorious word that is. Once it was the locusts that lived in me, but now Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And don't forget this, repentant sinner, who loved me and gave himself for me. He was, in a sense, devoured on that cross because of your sin. And Jesus Christ can redeem the years the locust of sin has chewed away. You need to get up like Manasseh did out of captivity and go scorched earth on the idols of your heart. Who erected those idols? Manasseh erected those idols, and then Manasseh goes down to smash them. That's what repentance looks like. You need to do the same. Smash every idol set up in the temple of God that is your own heart, and by God's help and grace, your latter days can be incredibly fruitful. We all need that hope. It's a truth out of God's word. You know, you will be astonished if you live in this way by what God, on your deathbed, by what God had done in your life. That has to deal with whatever situation you are in. Even when there seem to be setbacks in life or terrible disappointments. Again, I come back to the faithful caught up in the famine of Judah. Surely you think about all these. What disappointments there were that their crop and their labor gone. Years seem wasted. Perhaps you might feel that all of your labors for the Lord have come to naught. And maybe it's not your own sin. Or maybe it's the sin of another. Or maybe it's the sin of your denomination or of, of a group of ministers. Or maybe it is um, the church universal, the sin, or the sin of the nation. And it seems like your labors are gone for naught. Well, he promises your labors are not in vain, brethren. He promises. You need to take hold of that. The Lord often hides your fruit and will show it in glory. You know that too. However, you are not to be discouraged. And you are to continue to press on in the service of the Lord. Whatever station you're in. And if you perceive that things have gone upside down in your life, you are not to be despondent and not to be discouraged. Be not faithless, but believing. What a thing it is that our circumstances, which are all brought by God's own hand, can cause us to lose hope in God, to lose hope in Christ, and, and to get into the fetal position spiritually and not be of any use to the Lord and his people. Even if it is somebody else's sin, the Lord can restore what sin has devoured. May, many of you have spent years in slothful, I don't know you particularly, but if you're like any congregation of the Lord, many of you have spent years in slothful and unspiritual living for Christ. You did not redeem the time, even though the days are evil. You have been lukewarm far too long. What does the Lord say to you? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You need to turn with zeal to live for the Lord. And you must use the gracious promise that he can restore what sin has taken away. Even your own lukewarmness. It's incredible how many barriers that our flesh puts in, in the face of repentance. And yet the Lord takes them all away. He takes them all away. 
the only barriers to repentance you yourself have erected. He can and will replace famine with feasting. You know, the Lord often reverses situations so dramatically it astonishes us. Verse 19 in chapter 2. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And verse 24, the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. Well, for us with spiritual eyes, we see that this is a feasting on Christ, first and foremost, isn't it? He's saying, yes, the locust of sin has devoured your soul, but here is Christ who can fill you with marrow and fatness, and that is the promise of the gospel after all. And Isaiah, you know, in view of repentance, Acts 3.19 promises, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he, you know, it doesn't stop there. And he shall send Jesus Christ. That's where you find refreshment, in the presence of the Lord. You know, who is it that Paul was always striving for when he reached forth? It is Christ. You know, his years in prison to another man would have seemed unfruitful. But yet he was always reaching forth to Christ. And he was incredibly fruitful, even in a prison cell. Isn't that astonishing? You know, in Christ, Paul in prison had spiritual meat others did not know about. As he was feasting on Christ. Refreshment came to a soul. And you know, you can, you can think of all the ways that that apostle may have thought upon his life and thought about the way that sin had robbed so much. And yet he could be perfectly content as a repentant man in a prison cell, laboring and striving for the Lord in every circumstance. You know, what is most sweet, of course, is that when you repent and you come to the Lord in view of all this grace, the greatest blessing, as I've just said, is the blessing of communion with Christ when you seek him. And that is how your, your soul is fruitful anyhow. Without me, you can do nothing. He is the vine, right? We are the branches. And even if you grab the hem of Christ's garment, how many of you have experienced this? Even in my repentance, trembling towards the Lord, I grab the hem of his garment and joy comes. This is what we ought to be doing. Forgetting what is behind and reaching forth to Christ, even if that is simply the hem of his garment. And then you think, what are the decades that the locusts had chewed away compared to a single solitary moment at the feet of Christ? And how I find refreshment in the presence of the Lord. That is where true and lasting joy comes from. Anytime you turn to the Lord, you have an occasion of great joy. You need to also see, I wanted to read verses, I know time is running short. Verses 26 and 27 with you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of of the Lord your God that hath dealt what with you? Wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Oh, bless the Lord my soul, that he is in our midst. That he, the mediator, is in our midst. And he says to you twice, my people shall never be ashamed. What a God is this, friends? What a God is this that would tell us this? What kind of God is this? I deserve shame. I deserve shame for all that I have done against God and all I have done against man. I deserve the locusts. I deserve ruin and rubble. I deserve the famine. I don't deserve Christ held forth to me. And for him to on top of that say, and my people will never be ashamed. I confess with Daniel, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto me confusion of face or shame of face. But because I am in Christ, my shame is gone. And I am given his righteousness. 
And you think of this, on that cross, Christ took my shame, shamed before God and man, so that he could say to me, my people shall never be ashamed. Brethren, do not let shame of sin truly repented of stop you from making forward progress with the Lord. Do not take that remorse you and I often feel in this life of waste, keep you from the one thing needful and choosing the better portion, which is Christ, to be with Christ. Think on it this way. Is there any shame for the one who is in Christ, the one that Christ has gathered under his wings? Is there any shame for you? He says twice, he repeats it because it is too hard to believe that my people will never be ashamed. Even if you have, then, a single solitary year with the Lord, oh, what a year that could be. Oh, what a year that could be. A year of communion with the Lord, of faith, hope, and love. What sin has taken away, the Lord can replace more than a thousandfold. So you need to be fruitful for the Lord. You need to pray you need to seek the Lord. You need to grow in graces. And you are to serve him and his church. Offer the sacrifice of praise that has often ceased in the people of God. And really, and I want to put this before you as you think about the ultimate fulfillment of these things. At the end of the day, what are the years we feel were wasted and desolate? In view of eternity, the former years will be a flash. It will be as a vapor. He reminds you that his afflictions and chastisements are light and momentary, especially in view of the eternal weight of glory that is to come. And if you think about this text in that way, oh, brethren, is he not going to give this promise to each and every one of you that the years that the locust hath devoured, he will restore infinitely more. That is how unbounded this promise is. Can you imagine it? You will be in the presence of the Lamb for trillions of years, and yet there are more years left ahead of you than those trillions that have gone by. What are even decades of desolation in view of what Christ will restore? So shall we lose hope? Absolutely not. Shall we walk with him now? Absolutely so. But especially, and I reminded you of this corporately, which is what this text deals with foremost. If there have been setbacks in this denomination, maybe even the sin of ministers, the Lord can take, the gracious Lord can make this denomination's latter years more fruitful than the former. You know, the years you think even, and I hope I, I'm not becoming too personal in this, but even the years that resulted in this denomination becoming continuing, those years the Lord can restore if we would seek to be faithful to him. We must press forward to Christ and he can restore to the free church what locusts have devoured. But one caution before we end. Let us never use this gracious promise to live in sin. Absolutely not. Saying, I will enjoy sin for now because Christ, whatever I do, Christ will bless my latter days later. That is presumption. Presumption from a wicked heart of unbelief. You know, the Lord is very gracious and merciful. But as one minister of old said to those who said, well, I'll enjoy a life of sin and then I'll repent on the deathbed. I said, well, the Lord may very well do that, but I wouldn't make an experiment out of it. I wouldn't test it. Turn to the Lord now, lest you prove yourself to be a castaway. Because the believer is actually mortified by saying something like that. I will enjoy sin now because God will bless my latter days. That is not the right use of this. Now, I want to speak then to those of you outside of Christ. Sin will be your ruin unless you repent of it. 
you might say, well, pastor, you've been going on and on and on. I'm outside of Christ. I feel quite well. I don't feel any devouring in my soul. But that is the great problem with sin, isn't it? It makes us insensitive and blind to what sin is actually doing. You know, in our deadened state, we are rather like lepers, insensitive of injury because of our sin disease. You know, the leper children, the leper's um, nerve endings don't register pain, so that when he, if he were to stub his toe on this pulpit, he wouldn't feel it. He wouldn't know his bones are crushed. He'd get an infection and he will die. Well, that is what sin does to us. It makes us insensible that we are killing ourselves. An unbeliever, you might mock this message, but this is what sin has done to you. It's actually proof that you are what the Bible says if you are insensible. So your spiritual nerves are naturally dead and you are not realizing sin devours your soul. So if you are here and you are unbelieving, may this be the day that Christ wakes you up. That you would hear the word of the Lord and you would hear of his judgment on sinners. In this text is the day of the Lord prophesied, a day of judgment coming. Verse 1, for the day of the Lord cometh, it is nigh at hand. You know, the day of the Lord is coming for us all and it will make locusts and it will make armies look like nothing. If you could truly apprehend the day of the Lord, you would say, let the locusts come instead. Let the mountains fall on my head. Let Hamas invade my city. But keep me from the wrath of the Lamb. For it is too fierce. For who can stand before his power? Yet he shows you his grace in verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Whosoever. Whosoever. I don't know what barriers you've put to repentance and faith, friend. But if you are a whosoever, you are called to come to Christ for forgiveness and mercy and grace from a God who is very gracious to sinners. Don't put obstacles. Those are of your own erecting and not God's. Don't put obstacles. Do you see not grace upon grace in this text? Do you not see a gracious God? It doesn't matter how great a sinner you are. There is a greater Savior. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Repent of your sin and turn to him by faith. And as far as east is from west, your sins are removed as well as your shame before God. Praise God for that. And if any of you doubt the gospel is in view, ultimately the reversal of sin is found in the Spirit's work in the church. This chapter is best known for the prophecy of Pentecost, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Did the Spirit not get poured out at Pentecost? Yes. The Father and the Son pouring out the Spirit upon the church, giving it power and vitality and opening the eyes of the blind, opening the hearts of those who are hardened to reverse what the swarm of sin had done to the people of God. So pray for the Holy Spirit that he would reverse what sin has done in your life, brethren. And God has promised to give the Holy Spirit to those who would ask. If you want to be fruitful, if you want the fruit of the Spirit, children, you know this, it just naturally follows. Pray for the Spirit, and he will make you fruitful. So, brethren, leave with a sense of dependence on God, a hatred of your sin, and hope and joy in Christ for the latter days. Reach forward to those things that are ahead. Forget the things that are behind. Put them behind. If your years have been chewed away by sin, tonight can be a time of restoration and renewal and rejoicing even. And so I exhort you, put the locusts of sin behind you and with purpose of heart, reach forward to Christ. May God help us do so and may we bless him for his word. Amen. Let us arise for prayer if able. O oh Lord.
Lord, our God, so gracious and merciful. In fact, we do not even know the fullness of what that means. We get little glimpses of it in the Holy Scripture. Though we deserve sin and misery, the state of sin and misery, how it is that God so loved the world to give us Christ, to give us his only begotten Son. These things baffle us, O oh God. It brings us low to our knees in humility. And then to give sinners who have shaken their fists at thee, who have walked in uncleanness and lust and have done things that ought never be done and have despised and blasphemed God, who have mocked the people of God, who have done the vilest of things, such gracious promises as to say that my people shall never be ashamed. We stand in awe of thee, O God, how thy holiness is enhanced by their, thy graciousness. We bless thee tonight. It is all we can scarcely do but to have love and joy. We are as that woman who loved much because we have been forgiven much. Make us fruitful, O God. We have this one life to live for Christ. We have this life to be fruitful for thee, O God. And we confess we are often not very fruitful. So whatever the reason is, whether it be our sin, cause us to repent. When it, cause, when it is our despondency, cause us to repent as well and look to the graciousness of the Lord. If there be any unbelievers here, convert them, O Lord, turn them unto the Lord, remove their excuses. If there be backsliders, take from them as well. Their excuses is why they are running away from the Lord. Grab them, Lord, and return them. And may, O God, Christ be glorified, and may we all live for his glory. We ask in his name. Amen.